Um, good morning, colleagues. Um, can I formally open this meeting and welcome members to the committee and all those present to the 12th meeting of the Devolution for the Powers Committee. <coughs> we have apologies from Duncan McNeill and Lewis MacDonald will be joining us. I know he's got another appointment which he needs to be at at the moment. Um, agenda item one, evidence session on stage one of the Scottish elections reductions of voting age bill. I may welcome our first panel of witnesses to the stage one process. Uh, the witnesses are John McCormick for the Electoral Commissioner, Andy O'Neill, the Head of Office of the Electoral Commission, Ian Milton, who's got a heck of a long title, Ian, in the bit of paper that I've been provided <laughs> with here. Um, but, so, but you're here representing the Scottish Assessors, the Electoral Registration Committee, effectively. And Ken MacDonald, who's the Assistant Commissioner for Scotland and Northern Ireland Information Commissioner's Office. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for coming along and helping us with our deliberations. We've got a maximum of one hour, and I stress a maximum. We can do it quicker, fair enough. Um, so we need to be concise, uh, both in questions and in answers, if we can manage to do that. I've got a couple of questions, but open with a very general question, just asking witnesses uh, what consultation did they have with the Scottish Government on the bill? Um, what's your overall view? And do you have any concerns? Who'd like to kick off? Andy Neil is usually pretty chipper. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, obviously, we've been discussing with Scottish Government for some time the, the issue of uh, votes at 16. Uh, the conversations started during the referendum uh, legislation and they continued on uh, uh, following the referendum. Uh, we, we've commented on the bill uh, as it's developed. Uh, we're working with officials. Uh, we are also looking. We've been asked. It's in the it's in the provisions of the of the bill before you uh, to do some uh, user testing on revised forms, which will be needed under the new process. Uh, and we've uh, just recently uh, procured Ipsos Mori to undertake that for us. Uh, so that's occurring. So we're obviously all very conscious of the time scale uh, and trying to live within that so we can have all of this working with the annu annual canvas, which can start uh, from 1st July onwards. Uh, so at the moment, uh, we're confident that we're doing our bit to deliver all of this. Uh, and we think others are doing, doing their bit as well, if you can call it that. John, I don't know if you want to add anything. No, there are one, or, one or two issues we're still considering, and we'll put them into our written evidence in, in time for the deadline for written evidence in relation to the implications of reducing the vote in terms of uh, particular issues about donations and relating to donations for people who are under 16. It, uh, it, raises, uh, it might raise some unintended consequences, but we're considering it, and um, we'll be writing to you about that matter. It's quite Good. complex and, and detailed. Will you be able to provide us detail before we get to next week's discussions with the Minister. Do you think you'll be able to achieve that for us? We'll try. We'll, make, we'll try. We're, 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 your deadline for written submission is 1st of May, so we, uh, we, know we'll, yeah. we know that, so we'll try and bring it forward then, Chair. OK. It would be helpful just before we met the Deputy First Minister next week. No other concerns beyond that, just so I can get that on the record? No. no fine. Yeah. One or two issues rather than concerns, I would okay. say. Yeah, I mean, there are... I mean, there are issues around uh, deadline for registration of young people, donors. Uh, those things impact on uh, public awareness campaigns and that. But we're really, uh, because this is going so quickly, uh, we're, with, we're still thinking through some of the implications. Uh, so that's why we've said in our written submission we'll need to write on certain things uh, later on. OK. Ian, Ken? Yes. Uh, really, uh, since we last met in December, uh, we've been in consultation with the uh, uh, Scottish government officials and UK government officials uh, dealing with the, uh, the um, coordination between the uh, registration framework that we have at UK level and uh, what's proposed. Uh, and that's going very well in terms of consultation. That's going very well indeed. Uh, we've had meetings, as I've mentioned in my, my evidence, uh, roundtable meetings as well with uh, both uh, UK and uh, Scottish Government officials and Electoral Commission and, and software providers. So in terms of consultation, uh, things are going very well. Um, in terms of concerns, uh, that comes out in my uh, written submission and its timing, which we're all very aware of, uh, and that cropped up, in, I think, in my evidence uh, earlier on uh, in December. Uh, and just, if you, if you like a picture, uh, when we dealt with the Independence Referendum Franchise Bill, uh, that was first... Uh, 
published in March uh, and uh, got royal assent in August for a canvas that com commenced in October uh, in 2013. Whereas uh, um, the situation uh, for us with this bill is it was published in April and uh, we hope to get royal assent in July, uh, but the canvas will start uh, in August. So we're dealing with a much shorter time frame. So that raises issues uh, which I've brought out in, in, in my written evidence in terms of um, having to run the development at legislation, at operational and system planning uh, all at the same time, simultaneously, rather than one after another. So that raises issues. Okay, I, I saw that, and that particularly comes through in paragraph one, two, three, four, the fifth paragraph of your, your submission to ASEAN, um, where you say that there, that there are obviously issues of risk but if I recall correctly, because the last time we had this discussion, if I recall correctly, we were in private. Uh, no, actually, we were. We weren't. We weren't. Right okay, now. so it was an open, it was open session. Um, but at the last meeting, I think yourself, John McCormack, um, both agreed that as long as the legislation was in place by the summer recess, then that would give everyone enough time to complete the work properly. Has anything changed in that regard, or is that still... No, there? no. Coming to my overall view, uh, I mean, uh, you asked me last time in December whether it was doable, and I said, yes, it's doable, and it still is doable, uh, and, and we are doing it. So in, in that respect, uh, things are all happening, and uh, they're all moving in the right direction. OK. Ken, anything you want to add? Our, our um, interaction with the, the government's been somewhat less than uh, Ian's and, and the Electoral Commission's, but that's not really surprising given the, the role that we play, whereas they're looking at the, very much the technicalities of the franchise pro process. We're looking at data protection and the handling of, of that information. Um, what we did do, we encouraged them to um, undertake a privacy impact assessment. We encouraged that for all uh, policy and legislative uh, initiatives and as we noted in the um, evidence, the written evidence we've given so far, uh, they have undertaken one and uh, we're satisfied with the contents of it. Um, in general, you know, we, we gave evidence previously for the um, referendum uh, arrangements. Uh, we strongly advocate the retention of a young person's uh, register for the, the, the same reasons. Um, one thing I haven't covered in my submission, which I'm still investigating, is the issue of pre-population of registers, and I'm wanting to coordinate with our colleagues at our head office uh, to ensure that our, our response coincides with um, what they did when Westminster made the uh, initial legislation some years back. Go and just tell us what that means. Pre-population. The pre-population, when uh, the, at, at the household canvas stage, um, the, the forms will be pre-populated with those who were registered in the previous year. But there are issues where, obviously, um, house, households have moved, change in households, and, and, and that comes up. That's divulging personal information. And it can also be quite distressing, obviously, when um, somebody's gone through a recent bereavement and the names appear in forms. So there's issues like that. OK. I think Rob Gibson had a couple of questions. Uh, thinking back, uh, convener, to the referendum and uh, your experience of the public awareness and education campaign, uh, what particular lessons are you going to take forward, given that uh, the household canvas and individual registration is a different uh, kettle of fish now? If I could answer that, uh, convener. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think the first thing we'd say is the opportunity to collect uh, 16 7, 14 through to, uh, to 18 is best done at the canvas, so uh, that's why we support the bill uh, coming through quickly so we can hit the deadline. Uh, and it's, uh, it's worth noting that the EROs have, uh, will delay the start of the canvas till the beginning of August uh, because they can then collect them because hopefully a cent will have been given. Uh, we are we've obviously talked with them. We are, pl we are making plans 
uh, to undertake a public awareness campaign to ensure that we make, make all 14 through to 18 year olds aware of uh, the new legislative provisions and ensure that they, uh, as many as possible, register. Uh, we will be doing a directed public awareness campaign. It's not finalised yet, but we're, we're learning from the referendum experience. We're also learning from the experience of our public awareness campaign for the forthcoming UK parliamentary general election, uh, which is ongoing at the moment. Uh, we're looking at a directed campaigning to online uh, and social media and working with lots of partners to ensure that people get uh, registered and aware of the changes. Uh, a directed campaign is best in this regard, we think, because you're talking about uh, online. It, it, it's the cohort of people who actually obviously are online a lot. Did you learn that from the previous uh, campaign? Yes, um, we, I mean, and so our, what's going our, to change influence, this time? Uh, in the referendum public awareness campaign back in the autumn of 2013 into early 2014, uh, we used online, some social media, uh, some partners, uh, particularly Young Scott and such, uh, and we also did radio. Uh, we haven't come to a firm conclusion yet, but we're thinking that uh, we get better value for money by spending more money on online advertisements rather than radio adverts. So we, all, we learned that from the referendum and that we, the initial learnings from the UK parliamentary campaign uh, seems to be confirming that. Well, well, yes, I did, but you sort of answered it. I was just interested in, in who the partners were likely to be. And you mentioned young Scott, Andy, um, and I just wondered if it would be the same partners that you used at the referendum or if you felt you'd learned something that would suggest perhaps that should be widened or narrowed, more focused. I think what we've learned is partners work. Uh, obviously, uh, if you can get other people to talk to their connections, uh, it's, it, you get a better uh, result. Uh, mm -hmm. So in the sense that uh, we think partners work, we want to expand that, and we're looking at ways and how we do that in the, in the next year. Uh, particularly, yeah. we would then, uh, in the lead-up to the Scottish Parliament election, uh, hope that more partners would come on board and we can provide them information which they could use. Yeah. Were local authorities partners in terms, I can't remember, in terms I mean, in of sense, doing it through the schools? Were they formal partners? The, we always work with the councils and yeah. the EROs. Uh, for us, we've talked about partners being other bodies apart from kind of local government right, people. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are also effectively a partner for us. We've yeah. always uh, worked with uh, the return officers and the EROs and the councils as a council to provide uh -huh. them information. And uh -huh. uh, they tend to ensure that our public... They kind of dovetail with our national public awareness campaign mm -hmm. so they can do things locally so we're not clashing in terms yeah, of... Yeah, I just wondered about the uniformity of it. I mean, we, we heard evidence... Um, slight, slightly related in terms of um, discussions in schools and things, but I also picked up through that that the level of, of awareness through different local authorities yeah. perhaps varied. Yeah. And I just, you know, is it possible to to make make sure uh, that all young people in schools and indeed colleges and through I don't know, different programmes like Job Centre Plus and things? do get a certain level of information uh, that allows them to understand what's happening and indeed well, register? Um, as we mentioned the last time we were um, uh, before you giving evidence, the, um, we work with partners in education, you know, yeah. Education Scotland, School Leaders Scotland, the Association of Directors of Education, and provided briefing for them on the referendum um, <clears throat> and then passed it over to them um, to discuss with the Directors of Education and the education services across the country. And uh, um, we're certain, we'll certainly be doing that uh, again. We've built on those relationships. They're very strong. Um, and these are the professionals who know how to accommodate that information. And we're ready and standing by, and we've said to them, and we'll be having further meetings with them about preparing bespoke materials for that for 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds relating to the next Scottish parliamentary elections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, since we've got a a long tradition of working with the information officers in each of the local, the 32 local authorities. They part with, the, they do the local information. We do the national, mm -hmm. and then we work together to make sure they're complementary. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, since the chief executives who are in charge of the education services are also the returning officers uh, for the election, we mm -hmm. would hope that there would be a, 
a very positive response to the delivery of that information and accommodating it in the school curriculum. We're not educationists, so we couldn't say where it should go and mm -hmm. what should be displaced and how it should be accommodated within the school. So we're aware of the limits of our uh, uh, um, mm -hmm. power. Um, but uh, the best people, we think, to make those decisions and uh, how it's accommodated locally are the educationists, as we said last time. And yeah. we all live in hope of a chief exec and returning officers at elections, eh? <laughs> yeah, you want to reflect on some of that? Yeah. Certainly, just, uh, just picking up on uh, the points that Andy uh, and John made. Uh, the point is uh, that um, with the Electoral Management Board and the Convener Electoral Management Board, Mary Pitt Caithley, uh, there's a, an excellent key in there into the Chief Executive Network. Uh, electoral registration officers also obviously serve in each local authority and will work with uh, um, educators in that authority. The idea of uh, educationists being the best place people to educate uh, is, is one that I support, uh, but uh, the support from electoral registration officers and the electoral management board will be to ensure that the information that's uh, uh, given to the educationalists is, is correct and accurate uh, and, and helpful. And the, one of the op opportunities, if I may, mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. the, um, with, with this becoming business as usual, we have an excellent opportunity now to build in this into the citizen, citizenship training that, that goes out from 14 years onwards uh, through the schools. And that mm -hmm. picks up a point which was brought out last time about apprentices and people who have left the school system. They wouldn't have left the school system when they're 14 or 15. So uh, uh, it, there's an ideal opportunity Just for educationalists to build in all the necessary information yeah. Yeah. to the young people. I like the point about you know, the permanence of it. It's different this time and making it different. And, and I absolutely understand uh, the role of educationalists. I think what's bothering me and what we've picked up over the piece is the variation within these local areas. You know, so I know you can't be absolutely prescriptive in terms of what comes down to local authorities and then local authorities and others pass on, but is the information given and the guidance given clear enough that says, look, you know, this would be absolutely good practice. This is a minimum. You shouldn't go below it. Certainly, certainly, we, we, we need we need a, a national um, approach to this, definitely. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I suppose, you know, it, as with any subject that's delivered at the point of teaching, uh, the, the 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 style of teaching uh, will be different. But it's all from a common basis of um, mm -hmm. curriculum. So in that basis, yeah. uh, we should have a national approach. It's not so much the teachers <clears throat> that bother me, it's the good practice that comes from national down to that level that then goes down to school level. You know, and there can be huge variation in each of these steps. Um, and I, I would just like some kind of assurance that it will be pretty darn clear what's expected by the time it gets down to classroom, college, uh, training level. We'll be using all the powers of persuasion. We have convened, but you know, but, uh, uh, and to talk about good practice, and we have a lot of materials we've prepared over the years, you know, that are still relevant and can be updated um, uh, for this new cohort of, of voters. Yeah. But I'm still optimistic when uh, looking back over the referendum and what happened there, and the examples of good practice. And School Leaders Scotland and Education Scotland mm. are very much aware of the, the differential there was. Mm -hmm. um, and I would hope that um, the importance of every youngster getting access to top quality information will be taken yeah. on board this time. Um, Stuart, not this Stuart, but Stuart, I think he's got another supplementary. Yeah, yeah thanks, Convener. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm delighted that Mr Milton mentioned uh, the issue of apprentices. So it was a point I'd raised through the, the previous uh, legislation. Uh, but certainly a question to Mr O'Neill. Um, you mentioned that in terms of the, the advertising and, and the, well, the promotion uh, going forward, um, you're going, you will focus a bit more on online as compared to potentially radio. But there may well be some particular radio programmes where it would actually be useful uh, for yourselves to have that, that, that input and to, to really promote and encourage uh, the, the take-up uh, and people to, to register. Um, I can think of one or two, uh, certainly straight away, but uh, I wouldn't rule out uh, the issue of, uh, of radio. Uh, I mean, it can be a very useful medium. We've ruled it out. Uh, I think what at the moment is we're, we're trying to figure out uh, do we do it and to what degree. Uh, particularly, I mean, certain 
certain, certain radio programmes, if you're talking about paid-for advertisements, you've got to produce radio ads and such, which you can sell and such. But there's also media work which you can support your public awareness campaign, uh, which we do through interviews and such like. So we can pick it up that way. But we haven't. the plans aren't set in stone. They're still being thought through, and we're still picking the learning up from the current campaign for the UK parliamentary. One thing, if I may add, you know, one thing we're very excited about, about the recent campaign to get people to vote before the 20th of April was the two, area, two areas where we had done much more work this time and seemed to have had, from our early indications, a very uh, strong reaction was, first of all, a partnership with Facebook, where it was much more extensive than it was before. We built on what we'd learned at the referendum, and that seems to have been the, the variety on targeting different audiences through Facebook and different and Twitter feeds and things were has brought in a lot of uh, applications uh, to register. And also the, our communications team worked more closely uh, and targeted um, radio and television producers and programmes and asking them to include material about this in their editorial, in their programmes. And that seems to have had, uh, we know from our data, that that's had an impact. Many more mentions in news and current affairs programmes and feature programmes about the importance to register, discussions about it, and that's had an impact on the applications to register. So we'd hope to learn from that and build that into um, the next campaign. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Hey, Stuart Maxwell. Thank you, Kavina. Um, I've got a question um, on the evidence from the Information Commissioner's Office. and It's about section 5 on page 4 of your written evidence, paragraph 2. Uh, the issue about access to... Um, local authority records held for educational purposes is clear. But then you go on to talk about um, it appears to us that the ERO may not then have the same ability to access information about 14 or 15 year olds in independent schools or those who are schooled at home. Um, could you expand on that concern? Because clearly I would have thought, certainly in terms of those schooled at home, there still is a local authority input and duty. My understanding is certainly that for independent schools, there is no local authority um, link. Um, I'm less clear on, on the, the home education list, but I think maybe you are right that there, there is a, a duty for the local authorities to, to um, be satisfied that that's being undertaken. Um, our concern is just that there is a potential gap in the way that the um, EROs will be able to uh, evidence um, the, the, the 14 and 15 year olds. And it is a small number, but nevertheless, it's got to be covered in some way. Okay. Uh, well, can I ask the other members of the panel to then maybe yeah. hopefully answer that, that, that Certainly. Uh, query? The, uh, uh, there's not only Regulation 35 of the 2001 regulations, mm -hmm. but there's also Regulation 23 that gives the ERO the power to ask anybody for information. So, uh, and, and that body can be an individual or it can be a corporate body. Uh, so as, as long as that information is required in connection with the ERO's duties, then uh, there is that statutory provision in place already. So it's, uh, uh, for example, at the time of the referendum, uh, it, was, um, it was possible to get information from other sources that weren't local authorities and still is. So as far as you're concerned, those schooled at home would be covered, for example, by local Well, the schools, schooled at home, the home educated ones are essentially registered with the local authority, oh, so yes. that information that's is covered. available to us. Um, that's, I, that was my understanding. Um, and independent schools, you would ask them directly? Yes. Yes, that's the ERO would ask them direct and, and the information is provided. Right. It has been in the past. I don't see why it wouldn't be. Well, I raise it because the Information Commissioner's Office raised it, so I'm assuming that that's... We're, we're you're satisfied, satisfied by now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you, you had a second question. Oh, sorry, I did have a second question. Um, it was on a different issue. I didn't know, I didn't know you, were going to, you were going to ask me. No, no, I, was, uh, I didn't know you were going to do both at once. Um, this is about the Electoral Commission's um, evidence on page three. Um, you're talking about um, the publication of the register, and towards the end of that section... You say there are no designated organisations at elections and registered are available to a wider range of organisations than at a referendum. Uh, so specific consideration will need to be given to the issue. Again, I can ask you to expand on your concerns, if there are concerns that you're raising here, about the, the wider range of organisations that would be uh, available to access the register, or able to access the register, I should say. Uh, yeah. I mean, the model used at the referendum is different for the model for elections, uh, because the register used at elections continues on, it's permanent. Uh, under the referendum, the only people who got access to uh, all of those who could register 
uh, 16 year olds and such, was the designated leads, the yes and the no campaigns. Uh, the other 40 permitted participants, the other registered campaigners with us, couldn't, couldn't access that. Uh, under, the, under the current rules, we would have uh, all parties who are able to access registers, candidates, councillors and such who have a legitimate right to access a register, uh, would get the local government register slash Scottish Parliament register uh, with everyone 16 and over on it. Uh, you wouldn't get to see the under-16s. Uh, there is a suggestion, the Information Commission has raised the issue, which I think needs to be thought through, of uh, those who you would only have, if you would go back to the, the referendum model of attainers who would be 18 in the year in the life of the register would be on the local government slash Scottish Parliament register, but everyone else would be on the uh, young voters register and people wouldn't get to see them. Now, that is an argument about child protection. We're not child protection e experts, and you'd have to ask them, but at the same time, uh, we would raise the issue of transparency and the ability of people to engage with people of such age in terms of campaigning. I think there's also another issue which we need to think through in terms of do donations. Uh, it's, it may be improbable, but uh, you currently, as drafted in the bill, if you are 14 and nine months and therefore likely to be an attainer on the, on the register, if the law is the same as for as currently is for registers, you would be able to be a, you're, if you're an attainer, you we think can be a donor or a lender to a political party or a candidate. Uh, the issue for candidates and political parties, regulated donees, would be if you got a donation of more than five hundred pounds, uh, you would have to check the permissibility. If you can't get access to that person's uh, details, that creates an issue for you. Now there was. There, there may be a workaround which we haven't thought through yet, and, the ins and something which occurred in the referendum was permitted participants, uh, campaigners in the referendum, got access to all registers in Scotland. They didn't get access to registers in Northern Ireland, Wales and England. But if you had a donation from those parts, you, the workaround was we suggested that you get the donor to actually r get a letter from their ERO saying I'm on the register in wherever. Uh, so these are issues where we're still thinking it through and we need to write to you on them. Okay, there seem, there seem to be two this, ends to this yes, problem, yes. effectively. You know, one is about this, this, this privacy issue and one yes. is about the, the wider access. So I, I think there's still a lot of work, a lot of clarification required, convener, on this area, because I'm not clear about how this, I can't see how we're going to, what the end game is in, in this and exactly how we're, where we're going to end up. With some of this. I think the end game is you, you need to make a decision in balance, mm. uh, which is <laughs> our job is to give you the advice. It's your job, I suppose, to, to make, make the decision. I mean, there's a balance between child protection and uh, the ability of, uh, for transparency and the ability to uh, campaign to these people in a direct way. Now, you can obviously campaign to under-16s and 17-year-olds in, in, in a generic way, uh, but targeting parties in you're a politician, you do this all the time, I don't. But, you know, direct campaigning is, is considered to be more effective. Mm. So, you know, there's a balance. So, I'm in Stuart, okay. Are you, sorry, you You're the convener, I mean. No, you, you, <laughs> I thought you were first. I thought you were finished. Don't you I, I wasn't. Just a, it's a final question. Is, is, is really, you, you mentioned the information commissioner's evidence, I think. It seems to be that the, the, the stuff from yourselves on the publication of registered political donations links into the information commissioner's evidence um, I, um, when they're talking about sections 12 to 14, the protection of information, is that, is that the link you're talking about there, that area? That's, that's, that's where these, these two areas... I yes. Think so. yes, yes, yes. Um, well, um, Andy's brought up this other element which um, we haven't given any consideration to at this moment, but we, we will have um, a, a, a think about it, and that's on the, on the issue of donations. We were concentrating solely on, on the, the register and the, the publication of the register. But again, as, as we've said, um, we think that the separation, I mean, there's good child protection reasons for that, and the arguments have been well rehearsed, and, and no doubt other witnesses will, will bring them back to you. Um, but we were also bringing, uh, raising your awareness of the fact that, of course, the, the electoral register as a whole 
is used for credit applications, which um, by definition through, through, through law are only able to be made by uh, people over the age of 18. So we're passing the whole register to the credit agencies for their normal businesses. There is a huge number of, of individuals who would be on it, the 16 and 17 year olds, who actually their information is irrelevant to the credit agencies and under the data protection principles they shouldn't have it because it is irrelevant. Coming to on this section 12 to 14, if, if the register, uh, as currently envisaged, with the 16- and 17-year-olds on it, is handed to these third parties, these credit agencies, is that a breach of the Data Protection Act? The, 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 the Act requires the information to be adequate and relevant. That's irrelevant information because they cannot apply. Um, the thing is, of course, <laughs> if there's a statutory obligation for it to be, be done, and you know, again, that comes down to the way the Act uh, uh, is, is finally um, written, then it wouldn't be in breach of the Act because there was the legal obligation. But we would still very strongly argue that you need to take that dimension into account and obviously have the separation of registers. Sorry, Convener. If, it, if it's not a breach, I'm, I'm, maybe it, I'm not understanding. If it's not a breach, but if you have a legal obligation to, to do this, I can understand that. But you also surely have a legal obligation under data protection not to supply information that, which is, as you say, irrelevant. In this case, 16 and 17 year olds. Well, yes, but if there's a legal obligation to supply the whole register, mm. then that will, will um, that supersede. supersede it. Um, but in your deliberations, you should be considering the fact that actually that information isn't there and you should be abiding by these principles in your policy okay. development. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Linda? Yeah, um, it, it was really just to say, you know, the, the information, Commissioner Ken's evidence here is pretty strong, you know, um, strongly recommending, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I, I just wonder if we could, very aware of time constraints, I'm aware that we're having the Deputy of Government next week, and I, I wonder if we could perhaps... Um, have something back before that by um, the discussions you're likely to have following this meeting. Okay. I think useful to hear from Ian the implications of this mm -hmm. for EROs as well. Yeah. I mean, at present, the uh, uh, credit reference agencies are entitled to uh, uh, purchase a full register at a statutory cost rate, uh, and EROs are obliged to provide it. Uh, and uh, there's, no, there's no way around that at present in law. But the full register includes uh, data of 16 and 17 year olds who are currently attainers for, uh, uh, up until they reach the age of 18. So that information is already out there. It's publicly available. Uh, it's in the published registers that you can inspect in my office or uh, under supervision in libraries. So that issue really has already uh, essentially out there. And in that point, um, Helpful. I think, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in consumer credit at all, but uh, a lot of young people use mobile phone contracts, and, uh, and I think, uh, I understand, that uh, the electoral register is, is used to establish that that person has a link with that property uh, by such commercial uh, operations. Uh, but also the point about um, uh, the concern over having a separate register versus having uh, young, young people integrated in the full register. Uh, we've got to remember that at present the bill only allows disclosure of under 16s under three circumstances, uh, and it, that doesn't include credit reference agencies. Uh, so uh, in terms of, uh, we can only disclose that information to the young person himself. We can only disclose that information to a returning officer uh, or uh, um, candidates in the run-up to an election. Uh, and we can only uh, uh, disclose that if we're having to conduct a criminal investigation relating to voter registration or an electoral offence. And in any of those occasions, the date of birth or age-related information is not provided. Very Thank you for that clarity. That's helped Thanks. clear up quite a lot of issues. Can I just get this into perspective as well? Those under 16, how many people will we be actually talking about if, the, if we were in a balanced situation and balancing on the side of child protection and campaigners were not able to access that information? In reality, how many people would that affect? Um, Do we know? 
we, we, we talk in terms of around about 110,000 uh, young people between the ages of 16 and 17. So you then have another 110 or thereabouts thousand between 14 and 15. Okay. But not all 14-year-olds would actually feature in that. So I suppose uh, a rule of thumb, uh, very roughly, maybe 75,000. Okay, so compared with the whole electorate, it's actually, although it's a, num it's a significant number, it's not a huge number. Yeah, Two million. So, yeah. Just so we can keep that in perspective when we're dealing with this. Alison. A, a question for Ken, if I may, Convener. Um, Ken, in your submission, you point out that voter registration forms for under 16 should give very clear information about alternative methods of registering, such as anonymous registration. I just wondered, who, who why is that necessary and how does that work? I'll leave the workings again to the, 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 the Commission. It's necessary uh, for child protection reasons. Um, some of those individuals will be under uh, non-disclosure orders, so uh, people shouldn't be able to uh, locate them uh, easily. Um, normally, this, this is through uh, the agencies that they're uh, working with, education authorities, etc. But um, I think we need to take due regard to the fact that they are subject to these non-disclosure orders. And it's a responsibility, therefore, that we shouldn't um, uh, damage that in any way or risk the integrity of it. Now, also in your submission, that you, you think the Electoral Commission will have responsibility for designing those forms and offer to work with them in doing so? Has, has that happened? Yeah. Okay, as we speak, and we're happy to work with the Information Commissioner's Office uh, to achieve what he's talking about. So, okay. it, it, It's occurring now. The, the testing for the forms, is what, which I alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. uh, is the forms which would uh, highlight to people alter alternative means of registration, like anonymous registration and such. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Um, I've, I've got a couple other questions for to Ian and to Andy or John. Um, the financial memorandum lays out quite clearly what the government think the costs are. Um, so I think it would be useful for us to get on record whether or not you think the elements that have been um, allocated to, first of all, the EROs and the Electoral Commission, whether you're content with wh where, where we're at. I mean, people can always ask for money and more money, I know that. <laughs> and, but uh, given the discussions you've had with the government, do uh, you think you've reached a reasonable place? Yes. The, in short, yes, convener, the uh, ERO, the Scottish Government approached EROs to ask us what we felt the costs were likely to be, and we've given it our best estimate. And they just stumped up right away. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> They're not, uh, she's been negotiating harder. <laughs> yes. Uh, similarly, uh, they sought our advice on uh, estimates, and, and we gave them it, and their, they appear in the financial memorandum, so a work okay. end. Okay, fair enough. Um, also, Ian, in your um, submission, you highlighted challenges faced by three ROs in relation to registration software. Um, what are these and what has been done to overcome them? The, 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 the challenge is, um, is uh, having the uh, software houses able to deliver the functionality that EROs will require um, on time and fully tested because of the timing that we're looking at. Uh, the uh, software houses uh, who provide this, uh, the, the, the electoral management systems that we use uh, are commercial organisations. Uh, they're working under a lot of pressure to deliver individual electoral registration uh, functionality. And um, as I point out in my evidence, in terms of the um, uh, statistical management information that EROs and the Cabinet Office and the Electoral Commission uh, we're looking for, they haven't managed to deliver fully all the functionality that was essentially sought. Uh, and that is brought out in the reports that the Electoral Commission published in the revised registers that were published in December in England and Wales and in March in Scotland this year. So uh, there remains a concern that uh, the software houses will not be able to deliver the full functionality that we will require. And I suppose this is in a way emphasised or compounded because we can't give them a full system requirement specification until we know exactly what the law is going to require us to do. And of course, we're, that's the, my point about parallel development rather than series. 
where currently the law is being developed. So at the point of procurement and appointment, uh, we can't say, which is now, we can't say, this is what we want the system to do. Off you go and deliver. What we're saying is, this is what we think the system will need to do, but there might be changes. But at the end of the day, the requirement will be to deliver functionality so we can commence our canvas on 1st of August. So in that respect, there are risks. That's being addressed through um, a good liaison between Scottish Government officials, uh, the software developers themselves, and DROs, and that's working very well indeed. Uh, it is a challenge, but it's being addressed in, in, in the correct fashion. But it nevertheless remains a risk. Whenever you're relying on a third party to deliver something that is uh, necessary for you to fulfil your statutory duties, there is a risk that that third party might not be able to deliver exactly what you require. It wouldn't be a very clever third party who couldn't manage it, though, because in these circumstances they wouldn't fancy their chances of getting a contract again in the future. So there's every incentive for them to get it right. Absolutely. OK. Is anyone else got any more questions at this stage? That's very helpful, and thank you for bringing out some points which I don't think we'd all fully understood um, before we began this session, but, and, and we've also um, began to find some solutions to it as well, and I know there's still further work to go on in areas of donations, etc. And so it well, gives us some meat to discuss with the Deputy First Minister next week. So thank you very much for coming in. I suspend the meeting for a short period, and we'll begin again shortly.
Um, we recommence the evidence taking session on the Scottish Elections Reductions of Voting Age Bill and thank you for all the witnesses for coming along today. Um, we've got, I'm going to introduce you all but I'm not going to go through all your titles because it will take me forever. Um, but I'll start with David McNeill who's uh, with Young Scott, um, Louise Cameron who's a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament, Graham Connolly. Um, who is from the Centre of Excellence of Looked After Children in Scotland, Bill Scott, who's given evidence to us before, and Director of Policy and Inclusion in Scotland, uh, Philip White um, from the NUS Scotland, and Bruce Adamson, who is the Chair of the Board of the Scottish Child Law Centre. Thank you very much for coming along um, to help us with our deliberations. Um, just a very quick question. I just wonder, in light of the referendum experience uh, for 16- and 17-year-olds voting, um, what's your overall view of the bill? Are you, have you any concerns? And you probably want to tell me whether or not you support the proposals at this stage. I can probably guess where most people are coming from, but we need to get things on the record. So who'd like to kick off? Kick off? Bill, you're the most experienced person here. I, I, wouldn't call you, I, I'm not, I was about to call you a veteran, but I won't do that to you. I, I think I'd like a younger person maybe to go on this, because... Yes, that's absolutely true. <laughs> well, Louise, you can speak maybe thank you for from keeping personal right. experience. Yes. Louise. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me along today. Um, the bill is absolutely excellent. I'd like to commend you all on, on the work you've done on it. It's, it's really great. Um, speaking in experience of the referendum, I, 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 we were so happy at, at SYP that um, you know, it was extended for 16 and 17 olds to vote, and it's been even better that it's been extended for all future Scottish elections. Um, I think the experience of the referendum was absolutely great, and I mean, it's, it's helped us disprove all the arguments for against votes at 16, which, you know, is a campaign that we've been looking at since the start of our organisation for 15 years. And um, I just think, you know, it's such a great opportunity that we're getting this um, chance for 16 and 17 year olds to vote in future elections, because it really does encourage political um, participation in young people. And I think that's something that's really important that's going to come out of this bill, that, you know, we're going to get more young people involved in the political system and from an earlier age. And it's, it's more likely to create a voter generation because we're going to be able to engage them at a younger age and it's going to keep them engaged throughout their throughout their life, hopefully, in the political system. So I, I'm really pleased that the committee has considered this, this bill. I know how hard you've all worked on it, and I'd, I'd just like to thank you for you know, pushing it through. It's really great. Thank you, Elise. Very helpful. Very encouraging contribution to begin with. Thank you. Then you get Bill says, but. <laughs> <laughs> bill, nice. um, we think it's particularly important for young disabled people because... Um, 16, 17 year olds when the great majority of them are making the transition from school to adult life um, but I, they've not often got experience in making decisions for themselves their parents um, are often very protective of them, tend to make their decisions for them and so we think you know, that, that right of passage to adulthood and making a, a really important decision a political decision about who you want to run the country actually for them is, is even more important than maybe for other young people because in many ways they've not been treated as an adult at all, you know, even as a young adult. And this, and this is an opportunity to make a stamp and say, I am an adult, I'm, I'm getting to make this choice. And uh, I'll, I'll feed back later about some of the uh, experience we had with students for County Bridge College. Um, I'll come back to that, but, you know, quite inspirational, really, um, how young dis disabled people uh, reacted to getting the vote for the, the first time. So enthusiastic about it. Thank you. Uh, Any other? Perhaps I could also yeah. make um, a, a comment, uh, just in the general spirit of congratulating the Bill team and, and the committee. Um, Celsius and our partners, uh, Who Care Scotland, made representation to the Bill team uh, to, to ask them to consider having a section in the bill which uh, specifically um, had a duty on local authorities to support young people who are looked after to register to vote. And that was born out of our experience actually in the, uh, the lead-up to the referendum um, where we, we felt that local authorities varied considerably in the extent to which they had uh, helped look at young people who were looked after and living in quite complicated situations. And, and although the uh, referendum 
bill actually had a reference to young people. It's the same reference that's in the, uh, in the current bill in relation to uh, being able to register at a previous address. Um, actually, the, the, the real issue was in getting to grips with the process of registration and thinking about voting. So we're delighted, actually, that there's a, a, a section in the bill which, uh, which achieves that purpose. And I should say that um, in the period of during the, re the referendum, we had good collaboration, our three organisations, Who Care Scotland, Celsius, and the Electoral Commission, in providing information. And we plan to do the same uh, for the, in the lead up to the, uh, to the election next year. Good. Bruce? Curtis uh, uh, Law seems to absolutely shares the enthusiasm of, of, of my colleagues and, and congratulates all the, the work that's been done by, by this committee and, and, and others. Um, the Scottish Child Law Centre has been around for, for over a quarter of a century now, and, um, and over that period we've seen the, the introduction of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the, the incorporation of, um, of the European Convention within domestic law, the creation of this parliament with its strong uh, human rights traditions. And I think this, this flows from, um, from that. Um, the guarantee for free elections um, contained within the European Convention under um, Article 3 of the First Protocol um, requires the, the state to create conditions which ensure free expression and the opinion of people. And the European courts recently commented quite, quite a lot um, on the presumption in favour of inclusion. So, so the extension of this franchise is, is fantastic. Um, and and the, the wide political support for it um, is, is well um, appreciated. Um, what I think is also excellent about, about this bill is the, the uh, focus that's been put on ensuring that, that privacy rights are respected, the right to, to respect for, for private life, and recognising some of the vulnerabilities of, of, of children um, being different from, from that, from adults. And so looking at that, and then the strong, um, the strong references to promotion, um, and I think this is, this is going to be absolutely key in terms of ensuring that we actually engage young people, um, particularly harder to reach young people, um, gypsy traveller community, disabled young people, looked after young people, um, young people that aren't in, in mainstream education. And I think th that reflection in the bill is, is, is very, very powerful. Um, what I would say, though, is, is from the, the Scottish Child Law Centre's point of view, we've got kind of two roles. One is the, the promotion of, of children's rights, and I think this, this bill sits very closely with that. The other thing that, that we do, our kind of um, bread and butter, is, is giving legal advice. And of the 5,500 calls we've had over the last year, our calls and emails and other things, but the 5,500 contacts, not one of them related to, to exercise of political rights. Um, I don't know whether we can read too much into that, but, um, but, but I, I was, was, was quite shocked that there wasn't even one. And with all of the, all of the promotion around the referendum, the discussion around, around this, how um, active young people have been on social media, the, the people that contact us for legal advice, um, it, it, it's not forefront of their minds. So. Good. Philip? Uh, yeah, I think we'd agree. Um, so thank you again. Um, I think that we were able to do this for 2016 is great, and we're glad that the speed is being done by. Um, I think the referendum showed that it's responsibility that 16 and 17 year olds fully understood, and not just that, but they grasped with both hands. Um, it's a right that we now can't take away from them. Um, I think on a legislative basis, the bill as it stands is you know, positive. We've got no real concerns. I know there's some potential issues around timing to make sure we've got right. I think the real key for us is around sitting to the side of legislation is around implementation. Um, so following on from what Bruce said, and I'm sure it'll come up uh, later. Um, I think the referendum showed, so I know that uh, figures in terms of turnouts, et cetera, you know, they're very difficult to get down whenever you're looking at very small subsamples. But it looks like 16 and 17 year olds turned out highest amongst all the youth groups. That very much mirrors the Austrian experience. So whenever Austria dropped its voting age to 16, they were able to look at first-time voter rates, so 16 to 18 and 19 and 20-year-olds. Um, the experience there was 16 and 17-year-olds voted at around the average of uh, turnout and actually much higher than 18 or 19 and 20-year-olds. Seems to be a similar experience in Scotland, and that may be down to school, maybe down to political awareness and education. And I think echoing what Bruce said, I think around implementation, that's the real key for us and particularly for those hard-to-reach groups, um, so following on care leavers particularly are a big one. Um, but equally, if school does play a big role in it, we need to look at needs, we need to look at those that aren't in formal education and ensure that you know, every 16 and 17 year old, no matter where they are or what they're doing, um, have the full information that they need to be able to actually use this newfound right. Okay. David? 
uh, echo the comments of colle colleagues that were delighted to see the introduction of this bill. Um, and uh, no votes at 16 is a, a, a campaign that's been long led in Scotland by the, the SYP and the NUS, and it's uh, really pleased to see it. The experience of the referendum, I think, the, the votes, uh, the 16 and 17 year old first time voters, it was, was a real highlight of the process to see how they engaged in it. And I think the research showed that they turned out to be some of the most informed uh, voters, used the most amount of uh, uh, sources to, to find out information. So I think to see that um, kind of spark of um, engagement in the democratic process, to see that continue um, in the 2016 Scottish Parliament elections and onwards um, is, a, is a great achievement. Um, and uh, there, there's lots that we can do as, as partners to support that continued engagement. And I know there'll be lots of interest um, from elsewhere in, in Europe and other countries who are currently looking at um, the, the decline in voter turnout amongst young people and how they can reverse that. Okay. Can we, okay, that's very helpful in, in, uh, as a spread of a, a, an output in terms of where we are generally. But can I just ask Jim Connolly a particular question? Because in um, paragraph four, on page three of your submission, and, and obviously, Graham, I recognise what you said about the, local, the, about the bill and look after children, but obviously, if, if I've got it right, you want to see that going a bit further in terms of those who were formerly looked after children and how or are now either continuing a care placement or receiving aftercare services. Have, have you any idea how many people we'd be talking about in that particular bracket? Yes, I thought you may ask me that And, uh, and uh, how, 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 how feasible is it? Well, it, it, it seems to us that local authorities in practice wouldn't discriminate between uh, children who were technically looked after in the under the definition of the 1995 Act and in a placement, and another child who ha had previously been looked after but elected to stay in the placement. So in practical terms, um, we don't think that's a barrier. We, we just wondered whether the bill should, uh, should be precise about this. Um, in terms of um, the numbers of children that, that, that might be affected, um, we th the, a reasonable estimate might be 3,000 looked after young people in the age bracket 15 to 21. That's based on the, on, on the most recent figures, 2014 um, figures. Um, in 2014, there were th just over 3,700 young people eligible for aftercare, of which 70% uh, were actually in receipt of services, so just over 2,600. Clearly, we don't know the number who will elect uh, to stay in continuing care placements because that provision uh, has, has only been in, in place since the 1st of April of this year. Thank okay. you. Mark? On a little bit convener um, from that. Um, obviously, um, there will be a number of people aged 16 and 17 who will leave the education system, um, and so they won't then be captured by some of the um, information campaigns which are going to be targeted through education, um, education bodies, local authorities, uh, particularly looking to yourself, Bill, where in Europe. Um, uh, in, your, in your submission, you've mentioned that at the age of 16 and 17, a majority of young uh, disabled people leave school. Um, do you have any thoughts as to how we ensure that those people aged 16 and 17 who have left the education system uh, can be captured by, by the, the attempts to try and encourage them to yeah. register to vote? There are definitely going to be more difficulties because, because they have left the education, you know, a lot of them will have left the education system, but a lot then go on to college. So, if, again, if, if a focus is there on colleges, hopefully from NUS and others, uh, to make sure that college students are registered, that will assist. Um, certainly also, as I said, like there are colleges like Canty Bridge who, who specialise in working with young disabled people uh, to give them skills in the rural economy um, uh, at Canty Bridge. And... Uh, those sort of uh, establishments could, could be targeted as well, but there will be a, a greater difficulty in reaching them. Having said that, I think that one of the things about the referendum campaign was people were, you know, there were, refer there were registration campaigns run both by the political campaigns, both yes and no campaigns. I know uh, tried to get as many people as possible to register and not lose their chance to vote. Uh, I think that that 
is um, something that should maybe be continued by the political parties um, to, to try and encourage people to take part in the democratic process. Um, certainly, I, I've got long enough memory to remember the civil rights movement doing it in the United States to make sure that you know black people were re registered. But the Democrats as well have done it in the, the States to make sure that poorer communities take up the right to vote, etc. So those sort of things can be done within the democratic process and should be because it is really, really important that as many people as possible are registered and encouraged to take part in, in the process. And schools, yeah, colleges, yeah. But we've all got a responsibility to try to make sure uh, that young people take an interest in politics because it's their future that could be determined by the outcome of elections. I see, Lou, I see Louise wants to come up. Maybe just build slightly in a supplementary, which Louise might want to take on, which is obviously there are also going to be young... While, while I, uh, I take on board the point about going into colleges, etc., absolutely, there are still going to be a, a number of young people, uh, hopefully a small number of young people, who will fall into the not in education, employment or training category. Um, I wonder, Louise, is that something that Scottish Youth Parliament have, have thoughts on at all? Yeah, I mean, I think schools are really important for engaging young people um, in the political system and um, you know helping them supporting them register to vote and stuff but um, also another another vol valuable institution is like the youth work sector and also like voluntary organizations like SYP we did a lot of work on the run-up to the referendum to get young people registered to vote um, and I think political parties have been doing a, a great job as well uh, on the run-up to the referendum you know they, they did so, they put so much effort in to engage young people um, to you know, um, engage them in both of the campaigns and get them registered to vote. And I think that's something we would definitely like to see continued. Um, something we think would be valuable at SYP um, <clears throat> would be to introduce national guidance so that, because um, I know many, many of the people sitting around the table today feel it's very important to engage with young people and, and work really hard at it. But I think... It, it varies between local authorities how involved they can be, especially in schools. And I know that a lot of MSPs, um, MPs, elected representatives find it very difficult to go into schools. I think something that would be valuable for the committee to maybe consider would be to look at some national guidance um, to support, you know, every day we at SYP engage with young people in a, in a non-politicised way. We, you can speak about politics but not be party political. So I think something that would be very valuable would be, you know, promoting a national guidance so that MSPs can go into schools and engage people in the political system. Okay. Yeah, I think both of us do actually. Okay. Well, well let, let You're you, the let, oldest draw of you both. <laughs> also, I was a modern studies teacher. <laughs> So that's one over new, eh? <laughs> and I think that's pretty helpful because you know what Louise has opened up is the awareness and uh, the registration issues that uh, have to be encouraged through schools. And much of the evidence we've had has said, you know, we have to maximise young people's awareness and perception of politics, as uh, mm -hmm. NUS has said, and how YouthLink has said we urge the development of a clear position of what local authority employees, in particular youth workers and teachers, can and cannot say or do during that period with regard to young uh, voter education support and political literacy activities. Pretty clear that uh, Louise has raised the issue. Do others back this up about the idea of national guidance and particularly uh, getting over the inconsistencies that we uncovered during the referendum campaign about each local authority having a different view to the other, indeed the risk aversion that came out in those. Uh, yes, absolutely. We, we would support the, the idea of national guidance. The, the, the primary duty is obviously on, on the state to provide education for children, and, and it's encapsulated, in, in, amongst other places, in, in Article 28 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which talks about the obligation of the state to, to educate children in things like human rights and democracy and understanding the world they live in, the environment. Um, so that, that primary duty sits on, on, on the state, but what we need is some, some consistency across the country, because it is, is quite different. And we also... I think reflecting on what, what colleagues have said, need to recognise the strong role that the voluntary sector plays, that the strong, strong role that the care sector plays, that, that the youth work sector plays. Um, the people that are actually building relationships with some of the people that are hardest to reach, those are the people that, that need to be able to have the tools to, to deliver this 
this education. Um, and again, I'm, I'm certainly not, not speaking as, as an expert, but, but we need to acknowledge that, that people get information in different ways. There's different levels of literacy, there, there's, there's language barriers, there's communication, um, uh, additional support needs. The, the communication needs to be delivered in lots of different ways, and the guidance needs to, to reflect that, that um, the information needs to be delivered in, in ways that, that young people can, can understand it, and in places where, where, they, where they access information. And, and as I say, others have, have much more knowledge than, than me in terms of how we can use information technology and, and, and the internet, but um, what is most effective from, from our experience is um, getting information from those trusted sources, from the people that, that, that work with you very closely. Okay, does anybody else want to reflect that? David? Yeah, I strongly kind of support the, the youth link in, in the Scottish Youth Parliament yeah, position around guidance um, to, to local authorities about what, what they can do in terms of building kind of political literacy. And I think there's lots of evidence um, from the referendum process about what, what works well. For example, that, that the ability to engage in debates on, on the issues themselves in schools and not necessarily to do with modern studies um, uh, provides a lot of insight on, on how that can be be effectively delivered across across the school. Yeah, I, I don't want to back up. Too quickly, so didn't want to um, uh, be a slight on your uh, former subject, but I think you know we can't just simply rely on. I think the reason the referendum cut through as much as it did is because it spoke to a fundamental issue that affected everyone. Um, it wasn't about a system. It wasn't about a structure. It wasn't about you know an ideology per se. It was something that fundamentally affected everyone. I think we need to, it's not simply about a class, it's not simply about a subject, it's about providing that space, not opportunity for people to come together and engage, discuss, debate. Um, and that's why I fully back up uh, the notion of national guidance, because I think it's important that schools don't just see this as a political education class in the sense that we might think of it traditionally, i.e. a subject-based, a discipline-based um, discussion. And we do just simply learn about how political parties work, how the legislature works, um, how the executive works, etc. But it is fundamentally about issues. I think that's something we raise in our evidence. There does seem to be a lower level of political party identity amongst young people, but where they are very much more engaged around issue-based politics and issue-based identity. And I think if we can provide, and if schools, if local authorities have the confidence and the knowledge and the understanding to actually be able to allow that space, that opportunity, um, out with formal classes, that that's where you will really start to cut through to young people um, and really ensure that they are fully aware and fully engaged in the process. But yeah, it's no slight on modern studies at all. <laughs> to be available all across the country, uh, you could have an even bigger slight against it, but they don't. And, but personal and social education is there, and that's the vehicle. OK, so you defended your corner. <laughs> Wanda? Hi, and Rob, Rob was quite right. I mean, we picked up when, when we um, went back after the referendum uh, and various outreach projects to look at how young people had engaged. And the overwhelming thing, well, the first thing that came back to me was the variation across the country as to how different local authorities allowed people to engage, not engaged, but allowed people to engage. And the other thing that we picked up was a great deal of frustration amongst young people that they hadn't been given due respect in terms of being able to listen to the arguments and then make their own decisions. Um, now, I raised this with the Electoral Commission in the earlier session um, about the idea of some kind of national guideline. That, but I just don't think they got it, to be honest. Um, they seem to think that uh, if they pass it down to education authorities, that's their job done, and then it becomes the role of educators. But it's that variation amongst the educators, and even further down when you get to local authority level, education departments, and then into schools. So the Electoral Commission also talked about working very widely with partners. So my question to any of you here is, uh, were you partners during the referendum? Were these kind of things discussed? Are you partners this time round? Are these kinds of things being discussed? Uh, and if, if not, is that something that um, from this committee um, can go forward as a recommendation? Perhaps I can add some addition to uh, look after young people because, um, as, as I said earlier, Celsius and Who Cares Scotland did actually collaborate with the Electoral Commission in the lead up to the referendum based on the evidence that we had that there was a need. 
and uh, we produced um, uh, some frequently asked questions which only sat on websites. Now, it might be that there has to be further work done, um, but the, the group that we actually targeted were those who support and advise young people who are looked after, in other words, principally carers, um, be, because that's a group that needs, needs to be targeted as well as young people themselves. They, they need to have the wherewithal to answer young people's questions, and some of these are quite complicated and technical. So that, that's why we did that work. Um, and uh, I know that Who Care Scotland collaborated with the Electoral Commission in at least one event. And uh, there is a commitment now to having that experience to do, to do something similar in the lead up to next year's um, election. I think, I think that Linda's hit the nail on the head with um, speaking about the inconsistency between local authorities. I think you really have a good understanding of what's going on in the system. Um, from our work at SYP, we found that some local authorities you know, had, had really great opportunities to engage with young people through schools. Others didn't. Um, I know I can, sp I can speak from my own experience. I set up a referendum debate um, within my school and had set up to have political elected officials to come into the school to have the debate to then be told I wasn't allowed to have that. I think there's like a fe there was like almost a fear in the system that they didn't want to kind of, you know, commit to having elected representatives in the school, even though it was going to be equal pan like equal numbers on each side, be chaired by an independent chair who wasn't a member of either side. And I think we kind of need to eradicate that fear and, and make it and, and really emphasise the fact, you know, that you can have politics with a little p, it doesn't have to be party political, um, and put the, the focus more on political engagement. Um, and I think we can do that really effectively, and I think that National Guidance would promote this, but I think that you obviously on this committee have a really good understanding of what's going on, that, that there is political engagement going on within schools, but it just is so varied across the country that we we can't really say, well, Scotland as a whole is doing really well in engaging people in the political system at, from a young age because some local authorities are doing an amazing job at it, but others are, are just not having anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And yes, Young Scott worked kind of very closely with the Electoral Commission and, and other partners in the run-up to the, the referendum to build confidence of young people on what will happen when they walked into the polling booths and uh, to encourage them to get registered in the first with the very kind of mechanical um, things around it. And then worked with the, the, the Youth Parliament-led voter registration group to see how we could do that wider engagement. And I think it's that wider engagement bit about how we build confidence of teachers, of youth workers to discuss issues but um, not, uh, uh, not bringing bias and what they are allowed and, and not allowed to say. And that's where I think guidance would be, be particularly helpful in building that confidence in, the, in the, those sectors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the Electoral Commission said to us in previous evidence, I think on the 8th of January, um, that they were cautious about recommending a change what happens in schools. They said they don't want to go into this area. It was for education authorities. Do you think they're being too cautious? I come back to modern studies. My modern studies teacher was absolutely fantastic, and she she helped me with setting up the the whole debate within the schools. But I think they were they are were being far too cautious. I think that it would have been greatly helpful in the run up to the referendum to have some political representatives to come in and have a debate. I think that young people aren't silly. We're seen as to be like. Oh, they're going to be so easily convinced. We're not. We can make our own decisions. Sure. The, the independence referendum has proved that 16 and 17 year olds were making their own decisions. They weren't voting the same way as their parents. They weren't, you know, being forced into voting any way. They can make their own choices. And I think that the system needs to have more faith in young people and letting them make their own minds up. You know, it's not going to be seen as like if 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 maybe the schools were, you know, having three no campaigners in or three yes campaigners in and not having the other side maybe that would be biased but if we can do it in an unbiased way that's not party political and promotes political engagement I think that you know there's no harm in doing that in the system okay. Bill? Bill? Yeah um, I think SCVO brought together a group of human rights based organisations in Scotland um, who all wanted to see increased voter registration and increased participation because we believe it's healthy for democracy. I took part in a, 
an Amnesty International um, Human Rights Conference uh, last summer uh, during a referendum campaign, where we were questioned quite closely by um, colleagues from other countries whose human rights organisations tend to have political affiliations. Uh, you know, they, they side with political parties, etc. And we, we think we've got an advantage here that a lot of the human rights organisations are politically neutral because of the charity laws in this country. Um, that actually helps us um, in some ways reach out. And SCVO did collaborate with the Daily Record, uh, with ourselves, with BME organisations, with Oxfam, etc., to Poverty Alliance, to try and reach groups which were underrepresented in the electoral register. And I think you know, that, again, is, is, is a clue to future work that could be done in this area. But I very much agree. You know, I've, I've taken part in hustings in schools in previous years, um, you know, a level of debate and discussion. Young people are no mugs. They, they know <laughs> when, when they're being spun a line. And actually, as, as some politicians find out, um, they can get harder questions from that, that group than practically any other group in the electorate. So you know, I, I think there's everything to gain if there were national guidelines to, to break down those barriers and actually encourage educational authorities to take a risk. And that risk is worth taking because everybody has to take risks. It's one of, again, one of the rites of passage growing up um, is, is to begin to make your own decisions and, and take chances and allow people to make decisions for themselves rather than making them for them. I think it was Stuart Millen was first, I think. Uh, thanks, um, Just two things that have struck me. David McNeil in his comments earlier uh, said that 16 and 17 year olds were the most informed voters throughout the referendum because they used more sources of information. And Louise's comments a moment ago, uh, have more faith in young people. Uh, I'm going to ask Louise a particular question, and uh, I'm not asking you to name or shame uh, <laughs> local authorities. Uh, so uh, I've stressed that at the, at the outset. But um, you did mention in terms of local authorities, obviously there were, there were some uh, that, uh, that operated uh, better than others. Now, obviously, this committee has undertaken work. But, uh, but from the, the, the SYP perspective, um, could you provide any information in terms of any good practice uh, that, you, that, uh, that you were aware of uh, that, uh, that could be f considered, uh, certainly for well, going forward, particularly for this election? Um, I can speak about a more recent example. So we've recently just had our SYP elections, and um, the political engagement in North and South Lanarkshire was absolutely fantastic. Um, we had, I think it was, was 11,000 11, votes alone in North Lanarkshire, which was absolutely incredible. You know, it was a third of young people in the area. They were doing a really great job at that. Um, I think another valuable resource that we have is is the use, of, the use of social media. I mean, you can register to vote online now. It's a tool that we need to utilise. Um, you know, it's, it's really great when you can, you know, you can promote registering to vote on Facebook, Twitter, you know, all, this, you know, all these social media networks. And I think that's something we really need to put more work into as well, because it's, it's a way of accessing so many young people that the system misses. If you miss them in school, if you miss them in college, practically everyone nowadays is on Facebook and, and Twitter. So I think that it's, it's a valuable way to catch them. I know a lot of the work we, we did in the run-up to the referendum and engaging young people was through social media as well. And we, we, had, a, we had a hashtag... Um, on Twitter on the day of the ref on the day before the referendum and the day of the referendum to encourage people to go to the ballot box, and it received huge publicity. So I think that's a really valuable way to engage young people as well. But yeah, um, and North and South Lanarkshire were they were absolutely fantastic in the SYP elections. I'm trying to think of some other ones, but um, yeah, they were they were really good. I know they they're really good at their political engagement there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Think about that in terms of the, because you'll, you'll have got a, a memory base somewhere about. Yeah, the, I'm sure the, we can get back to you. Our policy team will get back to you with some okay. other results from useful, that. Um, we can definitely tell you where we've had huge increases in voting in some okay. areas. So we can get back to you. That'd be good to know. Yeah. Alison. Um, thank you, convener. I just want to have uh, a bit more discussion about those who are hard to reach, those who may benefit most from voting, but who are. You know, traditionally been, well, you know, I think um, Bill Scott, you say it in your evidence, even discouraged to vote people with disabilities because there's an assumption that they're simply not able to. Um, it's just too difficult. 
I just wonder um, what progress you feel has been made, you know, through the referendum itself. It obviously had incredibly high levels of participation. But if we look at, um, I see in your evidence, Graham, you suggest that only nine out of the local authorities were, uh, you know, uh, making real efforts to engage with those who were involved with looked after people. Do you expect, obviously that's not enough yet, but do you expect that we're going to see a real change as a result of progress that's already been made? What would you like to see happen to make sure that every looked after child, every person with a disability is on that register and is getting the support they need, whether it's mobility support, whether it's you know, educational input, to make sure that they too can really take part in the democratic process? Do you want me to start? Uh, ju just in, in, in reference to the, uh, you, you've referred to the uh, Freedom of Information uh, request mm -hmm. that, I, that I made, so I should uh, just say in defence of local authorities, that was at an early stage in the campaign and, and um, in lead up to the referendum and local authorities were honest saying um, very few had I think thought about this as an issue um, and had actually plans to contact or, or support looked after children um, or, or, or plans that were, that were concrete and uh, I, I felt actually that by raising the issue it, it, it had helped so that's the starting point I guess. Um, and if I, if I think about the examples that were given to me uh, by local authorities, the one that struck me as, as being um, the, the gold standard, if you like, is the local authority where a manager actually wrote individually to every looked after child in, in the age group entitled to vote, saying, this is your entitlement and we will help you to register. It might be complicated, uh, but your carer or someone who knows you well will help you to do that. And and, and, that was a, and there was a parallel letter which went to carers saying this letter had been sent. Now, um, that's quite a formal process, um, but I think it's quite empowering. Um, clearly, the, um, the, the other approaches that need to happen to make, to make this real uh, are, are varied. You know, we, we understand more about social media and making this, this fun. And I, I remember... One particular um, local authority suggested, we'd like to do something. What, what advice do you have? We had an idea we might have a kind of town hall meeting, bring young people in and have a speaker. And, uh, and, and, and a representative from a youth organization said, well, that's, that's an interesting idea, but we've got, we've got another idea. Why don't we have a kind of festival with, you know, with music and so on? And uh, as an adjunct, there will be information about registering and, and, and help to do that. So I think, I, I guess, it's a combination of, of the more formal uh, procedures and also understanding, understanding what, what um, you know, the, the methods that young people like to be, in, to, to be engaged with. Thank you. I mean, certainly that formal approach sounds like a sort of robust way in which we can make sure that no one is, is left out. And perhaps that's something that should be adopted by all local authorities. Yeah, I mean, my, my feeling was that, um, I mean, I, I, I confess that until I got interested in this area, I hadn't actually read the Referendum Franchise Act. And it, it wouldn't have been on my bedtime reading list. And I was forced to read it. And then I realised that I was pleased to see there was a reference to look after children. Um, but I had to read it several times to, to feel I understood it myself. And it and, and, and that wasn't enough. So I'm delighted, of course, that there is a, now a duty on local authorities. And that means that people have to think about how they do this. And it also means that that duty applies to every local authority. Um, so that the, um, the variation in awareness and taking this seriously that I uncovered in, uh, in the lead up to the referendum, um, at, 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 that addresses that particular problem. But then you have to think about um, how it's done and, and, and how it, it needs to be supported by, yeah, by managers. Staff feel they need to feel they're supported and this is the proper thing to do and they need to have the re resources. And it's, I guess, it's slightly more complicated uh, in, in one sense now with individual voter registration. Um, for example, residential establishments where they might just have, um, the, the manager would have automatically registered um, young people who are in the, in the age group. Um, because it's now individual, that's empowering, of course, but it means that that support has to be individually tailored. Yeah, what, one of the things that's changed um, quite markedly is the number of disabled people in institutional residential care um, compared to 
20, 30 years ago even. And the, uh, the people we were working with about five years ago, four or five years ago, um, a lot of them had been uh, in institutional care when they first were entitled to vote. And they had been actively discouraged uh, in some instances from registering. It had, really, you, you're not up to that. You, you couldn't make that sort of decision, etc. And, you know, uh, the learning disabled people I met um, were as well informed or as badly informed <laughs> about the political process and voting as the general population and as capable of making choices. Um, if they had the right information, etc. So, you know, I think there was a lot of work done. You know, off, off the type you've just described, youth workers, social workers, um, you know, working with families and parents to make sure, on this on this occasion, that their um, children did register. Um, and that's something we've got to continue to actively encourage because, yeah, letters still come through the door and. Um, they may be addressed to the young person, but actually quite often <laughs> they'll be left. <laughs> and they've got, got to be opened up and, and make sure maybe action's taken. But, you know, parents have still got a role in this. Um, and, and it is one to enable their children to take those steps to adulthood and, and, and assist them. And if local authorities can help in that process, well to the good. But I know youth workers who went out of their way to assist young people who... Are, are almost completely excluded from the system. You know, with um, offences and, and, and their background, you know, children's court, uh, children's hearings. Um, they they worked with them to make sure that they were registered, quite rightly, because they shouldn't lose out either. Um, so I, you know, I commend all the, the workers that actually took a step further than they were required to, to go, and, and, and made sure that the people who were working with, the young people who were working with, actually got registered. Thank you. Uh, yes, I strongly agree with what, with what Graham and Bill have, have just said, both from the, the perspective of the, of the Child Law Centre, and we work closely with um, young people um, uh, with disability and, and in care, but also in a, in a personal capacity. Um, I've been a member of the Children's Panel now for, for around 12 years, and one of the things that comes through very strongly with, with children's hearings is children that are supported and empowered to, um, to engage with the process have the strongest voice and the strongest kind of solution focus. They, they've got some really good ideas and those voices really need to be heard in the democratic process, not just through elections, but, but through other means as well. And the work that's done by, by organisations represented here, but, but also kind of Who Cares um, and, and others in empowering young people to, to, to express their rights and express their, express their voice gives really, really good outcomes. And, and I think that this, this idea of um, ensuring that um, parents and carers and um, workers of various descriptions um, are all given the, the skills and the resources to, to work with young people to make sure that they are engaged, but also that there is this kind of this um, more formal system so, so that there, there's formal letters sent out and that there's a kind of a check against that. I think, I think both those things um, working together is, is a really good way forward. I think... Mark had a question. Just a couple of things. I mean, uh, one of the most refreshing experiences I had during the referendum campaign was a debate, a uh, hustings debate held by one of the local churches. And uh, Alec Johnson was actually on the panel with me. But they, they had a representative uh, from each side who were from the local school. Uh, and the young people actually were incredibly good advocates for the side that they were propagating and it kind of puts to bed this myth about young people not being engaged because one of the things I find is young people are incredibly switched on and engaged with the issues of the day and care very deeply about them. The thing that they're not always engaged with is political parties and politicians and that's more an issue for us than it is for them. But there's another issue that I wanted to pick up as well which is uh, something I found during the campaign was I found people, adults, who were going to vote for the first time in their lives because their 16 or 17 year old was getting the right to vote or their 15 year old who wasn't able to vote was gutted at not being able to vote and was encouraging their parents to make sure that they used their vote as well. So I wonder if you would agree that there is not just the benefit of young people participating, but that through having those young people participating, there is a knock-on benefit that we might actually see more of the adult population participating because they are encouraged to do so by those very young people. I don't know who wants to kick off on that. More with what you're saying about you know issue-based politics. That's exactly what we stand for at SYP, and that's what we're saying all the time. So it's really nice that you've said that. Um, 
Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, in the run-up to the referendum, I managed to convince all my family to vote, which is unheard of. <laughs> and I had my brother messaging me on the, on the morning of the referendum, remember to vote? Of course I'm going to remember to vote. <laughs> you should remember to vote. But yeah, I think it, it is really, you know, it, it, it's been so refreshing to have this for the, for, for the, the referendum and hopefully it will continue. You know, that 16 and 17 year olds have been challenging their families about, you know, not going to the ballot box. And I think now more than ever, they realise the importance of going to the ballot box and having your voices heard. And maybe like parents who have been disengaged or, you, you know, not just parents, like, any anyone who's been disengaged with the political system has kind of had this revitalised for them because there was so much engagement on the run-up to the referendum with you know young people and other groups that it's just made it such a you know politics has become such a topic of discussion now around the table for young people and I think it's been so important that we've had this engagement and it needs to continue. It's been absolutely fantastic in the run-up to the referendum and it just means we've got even more work to do to continue engaging people um, through schools, colleges, youth work, organisations like SYP, Young Scott, Youth Link Scotland. You know, it's been absolutely fantastic and I, th I think it's, it's, it's a merit to the politicians and everyone who's been doing the work in the run-up to the referendum to get all these people engaged that, you know, we have engaged so much of the population in the political system again, and we just need to continue to do this. As David, a, do, sorry, as, a, as an educator, I mean, I'm, I'm convinced of the importance of the mutuality and the learning relationship, and it doesn't flow in one direction. Um, so adults learn from children. I, I think there is a, a subtle difference, though, in relation to looked after children, and it's to do with the professional relationship, and that's where there's a difficulty, I think. In families, you can generally be open in the discussion, and that openness extends to discussions about allegiances to, to a particular cause or a particular party, even if that's a different party with, you know, within a family setting. Um, I, th I think um, social workers and carers and others who have professional um, relationships with children are a little more cautious about that and they will have to think about the boundaries there, you know, and, and, and that unfortunately is a, just another area in, where, in, in which um, looked after young people's um, arrangement, living is circumscribed. You know, if you're in, imagine in a foster uh, uh, home relationship where the foster carers have uh, they are birth children and they have a foster child. You, that, that's a very difficult one to, to manage, where you feel uh, you want to discuss this and that discussion goes into openness, perhaps about your own views about voting. Um, but then you feel, have I crossed a boundary in relation to uh, the child I'm fostering that, that wouldn't worry me about my, my birth children? That's, that's a very difficult one that, um, that people have to think about. Anyone else want to reflect on that? Stuart, you got any other? Uh, sorry, Mark. No. Anyone else? No okay. Um, I think that's just probably reached the natural end of that conversation. Though. I've got a, a, a couple of things, a, a question, which is a bit mischievous, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> According to Votes at 16 campaign, there are still four parties in the UK who don't support Votes at 16. The UK Conservatives, UKIP, traditional unionist voice, Yes, that's what I thought when I read that as well. <laughs> the DUP. Now, Mr Cameron said he's open to the idea of, uh, open-minded to the idea of Vote 616. Do you think the panel will be able to convince him during the campaign period we're now in that he should commit himself to that before we get to the end of the election campaign? He should put his mouth is and have a referendum on it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think like we have disproven all the arguments against votes at 16. There's been extensive research done by the University of Edinburgh. You know, he's he's said that if if young people want to have this discussion, then we'll have it. We'll, well, let us have the discussion. We've said so many times we want to have it. It's been SYP's campaign. It's been UKYP's campaign. 
from all directions, young people are saying, we want to have this right at 16 to be able to vote. And I think that they need to have this conversation in, in the House of Commons and consider it, because I think it's, it's a very valuable thing to have 16 and 17-year-olds voting. I think we've seen that from the referendum. It's engaged so many people in the political system, and it's so valuable to have, you know, to start the discussion at a younger age where they can continue to engage this through their lifetime. We've, sen we've seen so many people turned off to politics, and it's such a shame because politics is fantastic. And I think, like, from, from making it issue-based politics, from getting people involved at a younger age where they can have these discussions, it's brought so many people back into politics, and I think it would be a great thing for the UK system to have votes at 16 for them as well. So he needs to seriously consider his priorities and have that discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a pretty strong place to end. I'll let David uh, is, uh, represent another... Uh, uh, Organisation. From well, I mean, no, the, the SYP in Scotland have been very active, proactive in the, in the support for for votes at 16, and it'd be great to see it introduced across the across the the, the UK. Um, and there's there's kind of lots of, of good arguments that I think it's 16 and 17 year olds themselves that that can convince um, anyone who's a, who's a doubting uh, about the about this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, there's certainly a natural coalition down south and certainly NUS um, nationally is part of that. Um, we'll see after the next election whether or not there's a natural majority for it in the House of Commons. Um, but I think Scotland's leading a really positive example and we'll certainly see what happens um, this time next year in Scotland. But I think the referendum show we can more than prove that it's uh, worth taking that chance. Um, I think going forward, it has to be looked at across the UK. There's a real risk that um, you know, young people are not going to be able to vote in the UK election this year. They probably will be allowed to vote in the Scottish parliamentary elections next year. They will not then, under the current system, be able to vote in the UK election following that. There's a real risk that we create a two-tier disengagement, um, where we're telling young people that their vote is important enough in Scotland, but it's not important enough across the UK. And there's certainly a particular irony in the fact that um, many election campaigns are fought on the basis of arguments about um, what we're doing for future generations and the amount of debt we're getting future generations into and the state of the country we're leaving for future generations. There is an irony in the fact that young people do not then have a say in what that is. Um, and I think there needs to be a natural, there is a natural coalition for it. There needs to be a majority for it in the House of Commons. And certainly I think it's one that right across this panel uh, and right across the UK, we'd certainly want to see taken forward. Yeah. All the objective evidence, and Phil's already alluded to it, suggests that the younger that people are, are able to vote, the more likely that they are to vote. And secondly, the more likely that they are to vote again. It becomes a habit. And the problem is, if you delay the vote to 18, and then elections only come along every four years, and this is something I'd like to see some research on, is what happens if meaningful elections happen every year or every other year? Does that have a, a, an impact on participation? I think it must. Um, uh, so, you know, democracy is a good thing. Uh, it should become a habit. And, and honestly, you know, no political stuff involved at all, but all the objective evidence suggests ca catch people, catch young people, and they will vote again, and that can only be healthy for democracy uh, I think that's in a, the I longer think, term. I think it's a good place to end our discussion yeah. today. I'm very grateful to all our witnesses for coming along today and for contributing so positively to our deliberations on the bill. Um, uh, on the conclusion, I just can just say that the next time this committee will meet, with the 30th of April, we will be taking evidence from the Deputy First Minister on the Scottish Elections Reductions Voting Age Bill. I now move this se session into private session. Thank you very much.